Welcome to Med Journal Club. Today we're diving into one of the most exciting diabetes trials of 2025, the Achieve One study, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. This isn't just another diabetes drug trial, we're talking about Orforglipron, the first oral small molecule GLP-1 receptor agonist that could completely change how we treat diabetes. By the end of this video, you'll know whether this drug lives up to the hype or if there are red flags we need to discuss. Let's jump right in. Before we critique this trial, let's set the stage. GLP-1 receptor agonists have revolutionized diabetes and obesity treatment. We're talking about drugs like Ozempic, Wegovy, and Mounjaro. But here's the problem. Most require weekly injections that many patients simply won't tolerate. Novo Nordisk tried to solve this with oral semaglutide, but it comes with strict dietary restrictions. You can't eat or drink anything but water for hours after taking it. Enter Orforglipron from Eli Lilly. This isn't just another oral GLP-1. It's a completely different type of molecule with up to 40% bioavailability and no food restrictions whatsoever. If it works as promised, this could be a game changer for millions of patients worldwide. So what exactly were the researchers trying to prove? The Achieve One trial had one primary question. Is once daily Orforglipron effective and safe compared to placebo in adults with early type 2 diabetes? Notice I said early diabetes. These were patients managed only with diet and exercise, not those already on multiple medications. This is crucial for understanding the trial's limitations, which we'll discuss later. The researchers tested three different doses and wanted to see if any of them could significantly lower blood sugar levels over 40 weeks. Now let's talk methodology. This was a well-designed phase three randomized controlled trial, the gold standard for drug testing. They enrolled 559 patients across five countries. Participants had to be adults with diabetes, controlled only by diet and exercise, with HbA1c levels between 7 and 9.5%. So these weren't severe cases. The study lasted 40 weeks with an impressive 94% completion rate, which immediately tells us something important. Patients could tolerate this drug well enough to stick with it. The trial was properly blinded, meaning neither patients nor doctors knew who was getting the real drug versus placebo. This is exactly the kind of rigorous design we want to see. Subjects were randomly assigned to receive either 3, 12, or 36 milligrams of Orforglipron daily, or placebo. They used a smart dose escalation strategy, starting everyone at one milligram and increasing every four weeks to minimize side effects. The primary outcome was HbA1c reduction, the most important measure of diabetes control. They powered this study for over 90% statistical power, meaning they were almost certain to detect a real difference if one existed. This level of statistical rigor is what separates good trials from great ones. Here's where things get impressive. All three doses of Orforglipron significantly outperformed placebo for blood sugar control. We're talking about HbA1c reductions of 1.24 to 1.48 percentage points. That's clinically meaningful improvement. Compare this to placebo's modest 0.41% reduction. Even better, 68 to 73% of patients reached the target HbA1c of less than 7%, compared to just 33% on placebo. These aren't just statistically significant results, they're the kind of numbers that change patient outcomes. The p-values were all less than 0 0.001, meaning there's virtually no chance these results happened by accident. But Orforglipron didn't stop at blood sugar control. The weight loss results were remarkable. Patients lost 4.5 to 7.6% of their body weight, with the highest dose achieving nearly 8% weight loss. That means the average patient lost about 7 kilograms or 15 pounds. Between 43 and 61% of patients achieved at least 5% weight loss, which is considered clinically significant for reducing cardiovascular risk. They also saw improvements in fasting glucose and lipid profiles. This dual benefit of glycemic control plus substantial weight loss is exactly what makes GLP-1 receptor agonists so valuable in clinical practice. Now let's address the elephant in the room, side effects. As expected with GLP-1 receptor agonists, gastrointestinal side effects were common, diarrhea in up to 25% of patients, dyspepsia in 15%, and nausea in 16%. However, and this is crucial, 
discontinuation rates due to side effects were relatively low, 4.4 to 7.8% compared to 1.4% with placebo. No severe hypoglycemia was reported, and there were no concerning liver safety signals despite initial worries about small molecule drugs. While some analysts raised concerns about persistent GI effects, the overall safety profile appears consistent with injectable GLP-1 therapies. This trial has several major strengths that make its results credible. First, the study design was robust, properly powered, well-blinded, with excellent completion rates. Second, the efficacy signals were strong and clinically meaningful, not just statistically significant. Third, the global diversity was impressive. 44% Asian, 26% white, 26% American Indian participants across five countries. This enhances generalizability far beyond typical US-centric trials. Fourth, the high completion rate of 94% demonstrates real-world tolerability. Finally, the safety profile aligns with our existing knowledge of GLP-1 receptor agonists, giving us confidence in the drug class's established risk-benefit profile. However, we need to discuss some significant limitations that affect how we interpret these results. First and most importantly, this study only included patients with early diabetes treated with diet and exercise alone. 62% were completely treatment naive. This severely limits generalizability to the majority of diabetes patients who are already on metformin or other medications. Second, 40 weeks is simply too short to assess long-term safety, durability of effect, or cardiovascular outcomes that are crucial for diabetes medications. We still don't know how it performs in patients already on background diabetes medications. Lastly, we have a classic industry sponsorship concern. Eli Lilly funded this trial with nine of 12 authors employed by the sponsor. Systematic reviews have shown that pharmaceutical industry funding significantly biases results and conclusions to favor the sponsor's drug. The funding effect occurs not through data manipulation, but through subtle design choices, asking the right questions, choosing favorable comparators, and selective reporting. In Orforglopron's case, comparing only to placebo rather than active comparators like metformin or existing GLP-1s limits our ability to assess relative effectiveness. Moreover, studies funded by competing companies often reach different conclusions about the same drug class. While this doesn't mean the Achieve One results are wrong, it does mean we should demand independent replication and head-to-head -head comparisons before changing practice patterns. So what does this mean for clinical practice? Orforglipron represents a genuine innovation, the first oral small molecule GLP-1 without dietary restrictions. For patients with early diabetes who prefer oral medications, this could be an excellent first-line or second-line option. The combination of meaningful HbA1c reduction and substantial weight loss addresses two major therapeutic goals simultaneously. However, we need to be realistic about its limitations. Restricted patient population, short duration, industry sponsorship bias, and lack of active comparator trials. Longer-term studies in broader populations are essential before we can confidently position this drug in our treatment algorithms. Cost and accessibility will determine whether this innovation reaches the patients who need it most. So what's my clinical bottom line? Achieve One provides compelling evidence that Orforglipron is effective for glycemic control and weight loss in early diabetes patients with an acceptable safety profile. This oral convenience could genuinely improve patient outcomes through better adherence. However, we must approach this with appropriate scientific skepticism. The study's limitations mean we shouldn't immediately change our practice patterns. I'd wait for independent confirmation, longer-term data, and head-to-head -head studies before routinely prescribing Orforglipron. For now, it represents a promising option for select patients with early diabetes who strongly prefer oral medications, but it's not yet ready to replace established first-line therapies. This brings us to two critical questions I want you to consider. First, how should the convenience of oral dosing be weighed against the potentially superior efficacy of injectable GLP-1s like terzepatide? We know injectables may be more effective, but patient preference matters enormously for adherence. Second, what additional studies do you think are needed before widespread clinical adoption? I'd argue we need head-to-head -head comparisons with metformin, longer-term safety data, 
cardiovascular outcome trials, and studies in patients already on background diabetes therapy. That's our critical appraisal of the ACHIEVE-1 trial. What do you think? Are you convinced by Orforgliprone's potential, or do the limitations concern you too much? Drop your thoughts in the comments below. If you're a healthcare professional interested in evidence-based medicine, make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell. We break down the latest clinical trials every week that helping you separate genuine medical breakthroughs from pharmaceutical hype. See you in the next video.